Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I'm quite excited to be here. I hope you enjoy the, the conference till now. I would uh, like to start with uh, a couple of questions. Um, so how many of you use Mesos for more than two, three years? Please raise your hand. Okay. And uh, how many of you use Mesos in production? Okay, quite a lot. Um, that's great. Okay, um, so the agenda for, for today's presentation. Um, I will start with, uh, with a little bit of machine translation context. Um, I will also answer to the question why we needed a, a new to build a new platform. I will present the architecture overview of our current uh, SaaS solution. And then I will uh, enter into more details about um, the new microservices platform that uh, we built. And uh, an important part of this presentation will be about uh, the lesson learned while building uh, this new uh, platform. I, I also have a demo um, in which I will show how we scale our microservices in order to handle better, uh, more, more translation requests. Okay, uh, just a few words about me. I have a software development uh, background. I'm um, passionate about people and technology. I'm interested in anything that is related to scalability, big data, and machine learning. Uh, and I'm currently leading the big data and uh, machine translation group in, uh, for, for SDL in Cluj, Romania. And I'm also the co-founder of the big data data science meetup uh, Cluj. Um, SDL is activating in the translation industry, uh, being a large-scale machine translation provider. By, by large-scale machine translation provider, I mean that we translate over uh, 15 billion words every month. Um, probably you are familiar with, uh, with Google Translate. We do the same thing, but for enterprise company. Um, the large-scale machine translation providers over the course of, of the last uh, years improved the quality of their services. They did this both by, uh, by improving them, their machine learning algorithms, uh, but also by um, taking advantage of the technological progress, being able to process more data, store more data, compute more in, uh, with, with uh, less money. Uh, what made, on the other hand, what made uh, really useful, uh, wh what made machine translation really useful in practice uh, are customization. By customization, I mean the, the practice of training the, the uh, statistical engines with data that is really close to the uh, client's data or very similar to the client's data. Um, and this customized engine handle, in average, um, translation uh, trans handle terminology with 24% uh, better, better uh, quality. Um, on the other hand, this, the, the training process is quite an expensive process. Uh, it's, it's an expensive process um, because of the time. I mean, if, if uh, training an engine from scratch five years ago uh, was taking days or even weeks. Now it takes uh, six or eight hours, which is uh, quite a lot. Uh, from hardware resources perspective, you need a lot of CPU, RAM, and disk in order to train these engines. And uh, you also need, uh, from the data perspective, you, you also need a lot of clean data, both monolingual data and both bilingual data. So we develop a new technology in order to address this problem. The technology is called adaptive machine translation. Uh, in the normal machine translation flow, the engines are built uh, by a statistical training process. And after that, if you translate the same, same sentence 100 times, you will get 100 times the same, answers, uh, the same answer. On the other hand, uh, adaptive machine translation engines are able to to learn also after they, they, uh, they were trained. So they learn in the same way, in a similar way during the, uh, the training process, but they are able to incorporate also feedback from the users after they were trained, and they are getting better and better over time. And let's take a, a concrete example. So if we have a persona like a translator that sends a translation request to, to, to a machine translation uh, engine, he will get back a, 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 an empty, uh, output. Um, he looks at this output and he decides that 
he has a not, uh, he has a better uh, way of translating that sentence so he actually modifies that translation that translation goes back into the uh, adaptive machine translation engine that engine extracts the some rules that he will actually apply when the same users come with a similar uh, translation uh, input so it will get better and better over time for that uh, specific user if we look uh, also, even to, to a, a, a sentence, for, for example, or, uh, an English to French sentence, if we want to translate, no further requirements are needed. The machine translation will output uh, pas de très exigeant son requisé. And he, uh, the translator decides that he has a better translation, uh, aucune exigeant supplémentaire n'est nécessaire. So let's see what the adaptive engine uh, actually learned from this. So he learned some new rules, like the fact that needed is probably, in this context, is better, is better to translate as, as necessary, further as supplementary, and no further requirements are with aucune exigence supplementary. Ne. He could also learn some bad translations, but he actually compares these rules that he extracted from the text, from the sentences that we gave them, with the existing translation model that he has, and he decides that it's better to not learn them because it will actually uh, lower the quality of the translation. So he, he does not learn them, uh, those ones. Um, and before we actually implemented these, several uh, experiments uh, were, were done, and we, we with human uh, with human help and we uh, ended up with the conclusion that adaptive mt lowers the time of post editing with at least 7% uh, in average okay so this this was the first use case the adaptive machine translation and we had we have also a, another uh, use case which is the neural machine translation so if we look back into into the history of tra uh, machine translation we we practically distinguish three main types of doing machine translation um, it's the rule base w in which you define and build a model by hand. It's the traditional uh, statistical machine translation in which you define the model by hand and you statistically learn it from, from the data. And the neural machine translation. Um, I'm really happy uh, that before my presentation was a, a presentation about deep learning neural networks. Um, so the neural networks wave reach also the uh, statistical machine translation field. So if um, for some time the, the neural networks were too computational costly and resource demanding in order to compete with the state-of-the-art uh, statistical machine translation, the situation changed in 2015. So we now see engines uh, trained with neural that are able to, to, that we are able to put them in production. Um, so compared to the two previous uh, transla uh, machine translation um, cases, the neural MT, in, in the neural machine translation case, you define an architecture and the architecture takes care of uh, discovering, defining, and learning uh, the model from, from the data. Um, actually, the, machine tr the neural machine translation uses deep learning architecture that is capable to learn the meaning of a text. As a consequence, the translation output is much more fluent and naturally sounding. Um, the neural MT also shows significant um, quality improvements over the, the, the past uh, engines um, because they are able to capture both local and global dependencies and they are able to handle uh, long-range word reordering. Um, in, for example, in our case, we observed uh, an impressive 30% improvement in quality for the English to German engine, which for us, and in general, it's quite a challenge uh, language pair to train. And the previous, um, uh, let's say, the previous, uh, our previous, in our previous tries with, with the statistical one, we managed to improve it with 5% and or 10% after investing a lot of time in it. So 30% is quite quite impressive. Um, we, we already have some, some uh, neural machine translation, actually more than 10, that we are offering into our uh, on-premise offer, but we want to put uh, these engines also into the cloud. Uh, in order to, uh, to put them into the cloud, we need to be able to um, accommodate new hardware, especially GPUs, uh, we need to, to have a flexible in infrastructure that is able to handle both uh, new engines and old engines, both CPU and GPU engines, and we need it 
we need to break the old implementation so we extract the cro common part and we keep this common part as a separate so we, we, uh, we, we deploy it as a separate and we scale it as a separate thing. And for sure new and modern API would help us to, to uh, onboard clients uh, much more easy and, and much more fast. Um, okay, so this, these were the two new use cases. And we, we, then we thought, okay, how can, how can we do this? How can we actually um, accommodate this use case in, into, into, uh, into our production? So we actually um, started to look into our SaaS solution that we currently have in production for, for more than 10 years, I would say. Um, the current solution is a service-oriented architecture, but all the services are deployed into a single uh, application server, so they are somehow packed together and deployed together, so we cannot practically scale them uh, quite easily. But we look more closely into the SaaS solution uh, that we actually built with the same team that we are now building the new platform. And it's quite a mature uh, platform uh, because we iterate on it over the course of a five, five years, five, seven years. So we reached to a quite stable uh, platform or solution. As I mentioned in the beginning, we translate 15 billion words with this, uh, with this solution currently. Uh, we have a high availability and we don't have P1, P2 bugs reported even, even fro, from our external clients or from our technical uh, support team. So we practically are able to, um, to discover all the bugs into the development or into the QA uh, environments. And it's the only large scale uh, commercial gray machine translation solution except the, uh, the one from, from Google and uh, Microsoft. So these were the pros of, of this solution. And let's now look a little bit on the cons of this one. So it, it has some flows that were built with uh, requirements, outdated requirements, so uh, five, seven years old requirements that at that time were great, but in the meantime, we, we, the, the situation changed. Uh, our translation engines are not modular at all, so we cannot easily add new things in there or uh, extract things from there. Uh, scaling down, uh, this solution requires quite a lot of uh, human intervention. So somebody needs to clone some VMs, uh, then run some scripts, then add uh, something into the database via some scripts, and then the, the engine is available to, to the customer. So it takes probably, let's say, an hour in order to, 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 uh, to spin up a new engine. And so I, we concluded that overall, uh, we are having a, a monolith solution that it's quite hard to adopt, uh, especially for the two use cases that I mentioned in the beginning, but in general for, for any new use cases. So the idea of a new platform came into the, into the picture, and we started to think more and more um, about this idea that probably we will need to, to build something from scratch. Okay, and we, we identify some key concepts that we would like to have into the new platform. And we decided that scalability is very important for us. Uh, we need to be able to accommodate new clients and especially large scale, uh, especially clients with, with a lot of translations. Uh, the latency and the speed is also important for us because we have also some clients that wait in front of a, of a, of a, a monitor to, to see the translation coming. Uh, we want to have independent services. Uh, in this phase, we did not necessarily decide that it will be microservices, but we want to have independent services so we can scale them based on usage, not to scale everything as a, as a monolith. We want to be uh, elastic, so we want to auto-scale both up and also when, when the clients are not there uh, for, for some hours, we, we want to, uh, to uh, lower the, the deployment so we, we don't pay uh, so much. Uh, we want to build also a solution that is, it responds well to failures. Um, we want to do as as less as possible uh, manual steps. I mean, we want to do everything via, via scripts. And we want to have reliable monitoring and alerts because this is quite important for us. We don't want to be called uh, over the weekend or, or during the night, uh, except if manual intervention is, is really needed. So on, 
we also start to look uh, of what other companies with similar scaling problem are doing. And we actually observed uh, quite a pattern. So we see that a lot of them have started from a monolith Perl, Rails, C++. Then they continue with the Java, Scala implementation. And then they ended up using microservices. We actually have a similar path. Um, I could, I could say that, ex for example, in 2010, we started with the same team to build the, the Java implementation, having a, a Ruby on Rails implementation that we could not scale anymore, even with doubling the number of machines involved, and we could not actually get uh, uh, more, more numbers out of that. Um, so we decided that we will follow the same path that to use uh, the microservices. Uh, after some proof of concepts and a lot of experimentation, we actually um, ended up with this technology stack. In order to, s to solve our scaling uh, problem, we, we decided to use Mesos as our, cl as our cluster manager. And uh, for sure, we are using also Marathon and Kronos um, on top of, of Mesos. We decided to use HBase as our NoSQL uh, database in which we store all the rules and everything that uh, that needs to be stored into the platform. We are using the HDFS uh, layer from Hadoop in order as a storage both for, for the HBase but also for anything that we need to store into the platform. I mean uh, all the content that we are we are actually using into the platform. In order to, to, uh, to solve the latency and fault tolerance uh, part, we decided to use Kafka as our messaging s system. Uh, all our microservices are uh, stateless, so we communicate between services uh, using, uh, using messages, and those messages are, are uh, persisted in Kafka. We use Zookeeper uh, both as uh, something that uh, is tied to, to the Mesos, but we also implemented some logic in order to do discovery of the services uh, around there. Uh, we use protocol buffers in order to serialize all the messages that uh, we are exchanging uh, in between microservices. On the infrastructure side, um, we are using Ansible in order to automate everything that previously we were doing manual or all the new things that we need to do into the new platform. And our uh, production environment is, uh, is in AWS. We, we actually started developing the solution in our private data center. Then we decided that it's better to host it into AWS because the old solution was taking out all, all of our resources in, in the production facility. So we did not have a place for, for, for new things to put in there. So we decided to use AWS and it was quite a good decision. Um, for monitoring and alerts, we are using the Elasticsearch, Elastic Logstash, and Kibana stack. Uh, the Grafana part we are using for, for dashboards and metrics, and I will actually show this part into, into the demo. Um, and we are collecting application-specific metrics uh, into OpenTSDB, and we show them both in Grafana, or we actually use them to analyze how healthy is, the, is our uh, deployment. And we, we monitor everything that is in to our platform using the, the Zabbix. On the microservices side, uh, we use Docker as, a, as our containerization platform. Uh, we started with Drop Wizard, then we understood that is more easy to use the Spring Boot part um, as, a, as a REST uh, application framework. Uh, and we started with uh, Java 8 uh, three years ago when uh, it was still at the beginning, but we, we had a, a good experience. So it, it also this one was uh, actually a good decision. OK, so this was the technology stack that we ended up using. So now let's see the lesson that we learned uh, in these last two, three years while trying to build uh, this uh, scalable platform. So the first one is related to the cost. From the beginning, we knew that we want to, be, uh, to build something that is cost efficient. And uh, we were quite uh, passionate about looking on how we can, uh, we can uh, optimize our cost. As I mentioned, we started the development into our private data center, uh, and we postponed a little bit using uh, the AWS. Um, and this part 
was not necessarily a good decision because when we started to put things into AWS, we see a lot of things that were different compared to our private data center. Our private data center is located in Denver, Colorado, and we actually um, deployed into AWS region into Oregon. Uh, when we put things into AWS, we see some difference, especially our engines are quite uh, IOPS intensive, so they do a lot of input uh, and output operation, and we could not obtain the same performance that we obtain in our private data center in AWS. This is mainly related to the fact that uh, AWS gives you so the, the performance of your storage is more or less tied to how, mu how much uh, how big the, the partitions are that you are using. S but we, uh, in the end, we actually had to change our implementation in order to, to, to make the engines less IOPS intensive in order to, to be able to, uh, to have the same numbers from our private data center and from our, from, uh, our AWS deployment. We also had a lot of configuration differences. Uh, and we actually decided that it's it's a good idea to do a production clone into AWS. So we test all, all these things uh, before actually putting our, our uh, release in production. We test all the things in the production clone to see exactly how, if, if we still have differences or not, especially on the configs part. Um, the production clone is quite um, uh, similar with the, pr the production environment. I mean, it has the same IPs. We are not using the same size of a Mesos cluster, but we are trying to, especially for cost reasons, but we are trying to, to, um, to choose the engines that are, are more relevant and, and to those ones to, to, to do the tests and the validation. Uh, still currently, 40% uh, of our cost is a non-production cost from the uh, AWS bill. I mean that only 60% of our cost is stick uh, production. We have some small dev clusters, QA clusters, and, and production clones, as, as I was mentioning in there. Um, to keep down the AWS cost, we do periodical cleanups of tr everything, practically. I mean, snapshot, EBS volumes, EC2 instances, and so on. Uh, we have some alerts in place. Uh, so when the number of instances that are running um, go above a threshold, we are receiving a notification and we start to look on why uh, the number of instances is, is so high. Um, and we also try to use the latest AWS type of instances. So for example, we are using X, uh, EC2 of, of a type R3 4X large, which, which they have 16 cores and 128 gigs. Uh, AWS released a new version of these EC2 instances, uh, which are called R4 for X large, with which have exactly the same um, specification in hardware. I mean, the same 16 core, 128 gigs, with uh, approximately 25% uh, uh, lower in cost. Uh, the may mainly the only. I mean, the only difference that is that they have an, an ephemeral, the, the old ones, they have an ephemeral uh, SSD disk, but we, we did not use it, so for us it was, uh, it was okay. Uh, we also had uh, a lot of discussion in, in the team about using the elastic block storage from, from uh, AWS or to using the elastic file storage. And we actually decided to use the EFS for anything that is shared across, across all the meso slaves and to use the EBS for other things that are more uh, local uh, stuff. And for sure, we are reserving our instances, as especially for our production cluster, in order to, to, to bring down the cost with approximately 30%. Um, the second lesson learned is about the security. So we, we had, in, into this new platform, we had to, to look at this uh, security part uh, from a different angle. Uh, we started by, um, so the access to our uh, production cluster in AWS is via only one SSH bastion host. That host contains also some filters in terms of IP that they can, uh, that can access this host. Uh, we also use GPG encryption in order to, uh, to not store our passwords in clear in Git and to also restrict the access to specific environments. So um, we had situation when some, especially at the beginning, when somebody was trying to run some Ansible comments into the production clone, 
but he ended up actually redeploying some services into the production cluster. Uh, after that, we uh, we decided who will actually uh, do mainly our deployments, and we restricted the list of people who have access to to run Ansible comments for the production in order to prevent uh, this type of of um, of errors. Uh, Except for this, in all, all our clusters, everybody has the same access and can do uh, whatever they want. As I mentioned, the only restrictions are, are into the production environments. And we enable AWS uh, termination protection. It's just a click in there. But we ended up um, enabling as, uh, only after somebody from the team, not the same person as before, actually terminated a, a meso slave by mistake. Which, which was not a, a big issue, but if he could, if he would terminate the whole cluster, then then that would have been a, an issue. Um, on the high availability side, so we usually on the infrastructure side, we usu usually allocate uh, one node, actually 10% more than the capacity that is quite needed in order to to be uh, highly available, even if some human error are happening, as I was mentioning before. But we also had cases when our EC2 instances were were um, were decommissioned, um, and we had to rebuild them. Uh, f it, it it did not happen uh, frequently, but we had some situation uh, uh, of this type. Um, and on the microservices side, uh, we as allocate at least two instances per type of microservice. We are doing this for high availability purpose, even if in some cases would not have be have. Uh, been ju justified by the by the traffic on that microservice, and we also put some constraints to not deploy these two uh, instances on the same Mesos uh, agent, uh, in order not if, if that agent goes down to not uh, to not lose the 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 uh, that micro that microservice. Um, we also test our we are doing tests. Um, uh, in our QA environments, QA performance environments, with 5x or 10x more traffic, in order compared to what we expect or what we have in production, in order to reach the limits of our platform and to know if if things will break, what would be the first components that that will actually break, and we we uh, including from the previous solution that we built, we understood that monitoring is really important. So we invested quite a lot of time in, in monitoring from all different angles uh, these microservices and this platform. So we are using Zabbix, as I was mentioning, for the infrastructure. We are collecting application-specific metrics that we show. Uh, we have a screen uh, in, into our uh, office that we show a lot of uh, healthy, uh, dash I mean, dashboard related to the health of the deployment. Uh, we are collecting uh, application. Uh, I mean, use the statistic of everything that happens into the platform, all the activities that the user perform into a platform, as I mentioned, using the Elasticsearch Log Stash Kibana. And we are also uh, doing external monitoring using Pingdom and uh, PagerDuty to call us in case uh, something is really wrong. Um, on the resource allocation side, so. Uh, for example, in the in the uh, on the memory limitation uh, part, we initially started quite at the beginning by by setting only uh, marathon uh, restrictions on the on the at, at the container side. I mean, um, we had one container. We see that we we say that it has it needs one gig of memory. Uh, what after some time we were seeing some containers uh, being killed. When we investigated the issue, we see that we saw that. Um, Actually, those containers were seeing the memory of the whole Mesos agent, so 138 gigs uh, compared to one gig. I know that it's uh, quite a dummy uh, thing, but we we managed to f to fix it only after actually seeing it uh, uh, not in production in our QA environments. Uh, so we set uh, we set some limits both at the marathon side and at the Docker side. Of of the same one gig, let's say, uh, but occasionally we will still seeing some microservices dying. And we, when we investigated, we were seeing that actually the JVM was trying to take all the one gig of memory, and he could not garbage collect so fast the things when when they were reaching to the higher limit. So Marathon just just kill uh, it, it was just killing the those containers. So we actually set uh, constraints both at, at the JV, JVM side. 
uh, this time it was uh, let's say with 10% lower the limit like 900 megs on the on the JVM side uh, 1 gig at the docker side and uh, 1 gig at the, at the marathon side and this actually solved uh, our, our our problem uh, while investigating this we understood that we are doing crash dumps but we don't actually save them uh, outside so we are actually losing them so we mounted a, a partition on each of the container uh, that is actually uh, available even after the container died so we are uh, able to investigate uh, and, and take the core dump and see exactly what happened in there. Um, related to the CPU allocation, so as, as you probably know the CPU um, are actually CPU weights so initially we started if we needed one core we allocated one as a, as a CPU weight uh, we concluded that is not the best idea because in this case we could not use our clusters um, uh, very efficient and we could not do over provision so we uh, we actually lower all the all the CPU weights from 1 to 0 to uh, and now we are able to to use our uh, cluster uh, even even better okay so the the second one is is related to the releases um, so when we started this platform, we were thinking, okay, we are building something scalable, except for maybe the load balancer, we don't have any single point of failure into this. So releases with no dime time will be quite, quite fast to do. Uh, it was not actually the case, um, because they were, uh, there are so many components into, uh, in, in, in involved into a deployment of this. As I mentioned, um, we have quite a few, 30, I, I mean, we currently have more than 35 type of microservices um, and a lot of things could go wrong. So we actually uh, invested quite some time in order to do the, clo the production clone in order to simulate our deployments two or three times before actually releasing them into the, into the production in order to catch all the differences that, that uh, are uh, uh, between our QA environment and the production environment. We also uh, did some scripts in order to monitor the downtime so we actually know if you want to have releases with no downtime, first we need to know how to measure them that they are without uh, downtime. And we also invested some time uh, in, in uh, making these messages that are circulating between um, uh, microservices compatible uh, from different versions. On this side, the pro usi using the proto protocol buffer uh, helped us uh, a lot. Um, we, we invested also some time in ensibilizing uh, all the manual steps that are, were involved into the deployment. So now the deployment is um, probably one or two uh, ansible comments and everything happens as, as uh, in there. Um, so we have, we have ansible comments that are for almost all the activity that we are doing in order to keep this cluster up, to do upgrades. Um, to do deployments. And we are also able to bring up a cluster from zero, I mean from zero not having nothing, to um, bring up EC2 instances, deploy all the components, deploy all the microservices, validate that the, this cluster is healthy. Um, and we are doing, and it takes around 20 to 30 minutes to, to do all these steps. Um, all the investigations into this distributed platform uh, became quite a, a big issue. I mean, it, it became quite a complex issue. Um, so in the previous solution, we had uh, logs that uh, were into, I mean, having all the services deployed into a single application server, it's, it's a big advantage because you can at least track when the client with a request hit your, your first endpoint and all the steps that he made uh, along the way uh, because he did it in the same application server if, even if you have multiple deployments. Um, in this case, when a flow maybe um, hits 10 to 12 or 15 microservices, it's really hard to understand all the uh, operation that the user made before uh, from the entering point to the to the exit point, so uh, we aggregated our log into um, uh, Elasticsearch log slash Kibana. We had to uh, attach a uh, request ID to each of the messages that were circulating and each of the logs that were circulating into the into the platform to be able to 
to, to um, investigate per request uh, uh, later. Um, initially, we were both shipping the logs into the Elasticsearch, but we were also using the STD out because it was much more easy to debug things uh, in at the, at the Mesos level. Uh, quite quickly, our uh, Mesos agents remain without disk, so we actually had to disable the STD out, and we only ship them into Elasticsearch. After that, when we started to 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 do some performance and do, to do some load on the platform, we understood that the the get the pander that we were using that was sh was shipping things to Elasticsearch could not keep up with the volume of the load that was coming from our clients, so we had had to to do a trick to send it first to Kafka and Kafka will send it uh, to to Elasticsearch. So we still see a little bit of delay between when we see the request entering and and um, and when it appears in our graph, but it's it's quite an acceptable delay, like. A I don't know, was, uh, under a second, let's say. Um, we are collecting applications as specific metrics into OpenDSDB, and usually when some things go wrong, we had to correlate all these sources and understand where, it, where, the, problems, uh, where the problem is. Um, I, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, when we we identified the key concepts. We said that we want to have independence, independent microservices. Um, it's, it's something that all the people in the team agree with. It was not so easy to, it was not an easy goal to achieve. Um, as I mentioned, we have more than 30 microservices now. Um, it was a challenge, especially for the legacy code. So we took some code, especially related to our engines, from the legacy solution, uh, and we we pack it as a microservice, as a microservice, and we extract also parts that could be extracted uh, as independent uh, services. Um, what surprised us a little bit is that even on the new services that we define from scratch, after two, three months, we realized that uh, those services could be broken into multiple uh, s microservices all over again. And um, so it's quite a continuous uh, refactoring process in order to identify things that we can actually uh, break into even more microservices. Probably the 30 uh, microservice um, a uh, number does not sound like a big number compared to the Netflix who were having, I think, 350 uh, or something like that. But for us, from uh, a monolith to 30 plus microservices, it's, it's quite a, an achievement. Um, and the last, less, uh, the last lesson learned, it's about uh, the fact that we have had to reevaluate our assumptions periodically. So when we started the platform, uh, considering also the previous experience that we had in the different solution and in on the serving different machine translation use case, we were thinking that we can imagine qui quite well what, what the users will do. Um, and then we released uh, uh, an alpha uh, version and then a beta with for a, sim a limited set of users. And then we understood that actually they don't use our APIs in the way that we actually recommend it or in the way that we actually expect it. So we had to change some of our APIs, uh, in some cases two or three versions in order to accommodate better the, the way that the, our clients are, are using it. Um, in, in for the adaptive machine translation flow, we have now, I think, more than two, 3,000 users, uh, which is not necessarily an impressive number compared to the previous uh, solution, but it's, it's still uh, a big number. Um, we understood that also the speed of, of, our, um, of our request is quite important, especially for the uh, sync uh, request, because some people are waiting for, for your translation to appear, so it would be nice to, to appear in, in a decent time. Uh, and since uh, into our previous solution, the English to Spanish uh, language pair was the most highly used one, we were thinking that also for this um, adaptive machine translation, it will be. It was not the case. We had more users on the English to French, English to Dutch, that than on English to to, to Spanish. So we had to adopt. Uh, we had to adjust our our allocation of resources uh, by lowering the English to Spanish resources and and uh, uh, giving more to the English French and English Dutch. Um, 
Okay, so even if we build, we are building this uh, platform for over two years now, and we learn a lot of things, we manage to fix a lot of things, we are still, uh, I mean, we realize that it's, it's, we still have a lot of things to do. And um, for example, uh, the periodical upgrades of a stack, you see that there are many things in the stack, it's quite uh, a demanding task. I mean, it takes quite a lot in order to, to keep up with the latest, uh, latest technology stack. And we are periodically investing this time uh, and try to minimize the, the features that we are creating into the platform. We still need to uh, do improvements on the monitoring side. Uh, even if we are at a decent level no right now, we, we understand that we can uh, do better than that. From the beginning, we realized that auto-scaling would be quite a nice thing to do. Um, so right now, as I mentioned, in the previous uh, framework, in the previous solution, sorry, uh, we had to manually add VMs, run some scripts, add some DB scripts uh, in order to, to accommodate uh, uh, an increase in, in, in the deployment, even if some of these things we were doing with scripts. Right now, with a single click into, into Marathon, you can scale your, your microservices. So it's quite easy, but it still involves that somebody realize that we need to scale that microservice because the load on that specific engine uh, is now uh, bigger. So somebody needs to uh, give that uh, click. We see also yesterday in the Netflix presentation, a, a nice slide about how they do auto scaling. Um, we also have clients into the old solution that are coming, like uh, they translate for six months, uh, for six, sorry, so for six hours at a huge traffic. After that, for the whole day, they don't come. Uh, they don't come back. They come only the next day. So in this type of of, um, of use cases, the auto scaling, uh, it, it's it's really uh, worth. Uh, investing time in and because it can uh, lower the cost quite significantly. Um, so also the maybe it would be um, nice to say, so the size of our Mesos cluster, it's between 10 and 20 nodes, which is not very huge. Uh, for example, into the old uh, solution, we have more than 3000 VMs that we, we uh, accommodate into the production environment, but this, this, uh, th so the the Mesos part is mainly because we uh, accommodated new uh, features, as as uh, as I mentioned, adaptive anti, which takes quite some time until people actually understood that idea, um, are are trying are trying it, are seeing that there are benefits and they are adopting it. So it's quite a, a, a process that it will take some time. On the other hand, we. Uh, over the future, we want to migrate um, even more clients from the old solution to the to the new ones, and then we will actually see a lot more traffic. Um, we still have a lot of components that are not in Mesos, uh, uh, especially I'm referring here to the HBase, HDFS, Kafka, and Zookeeper. Uh, currently, all of them are actually managed by Ambari. But we w would like to, to actually migrate them into, um, into Mesos, maybe uh, uh, into DCOS actually, um, in order to uh, be able to use the cluster e even more efficient. So for example, HBase is quite a CPU intensive for us, and uh, the machines that we allocated are, are um, using the CPU 80-90%. And in the uh, Mesos uh, cluster, we have uh, some CPUs available. So they would actually uh, be a good fit to actually use the same uh, resources. Uh, but th this migration requires quite, quite some time, so we, uh, for some time we, we, uh, we postpone it a little bit. And there is also the Elasticsearch part, we, which is still kept outside of a, of a Mesos. Okay, so um, let's see now uh, a demo. I actually recorded this part in order not to have uh, surprises. Um, okay. I will use it without uh, without voice, and I will try to to explain. So we will start our our demo from the Marathon UI. We have here an English to Dutch engine that currently has one instance, uh, so one microservices instance that is uh, healthy. Um, then we see here in uh, that 
actually this is a, our QA cluster of, uh, of Mesos. We have nine, uh, nine slaves and a lot of microservices deployed. And we will use Grafana in order to see uh, some numbers on actually how, how the, the, the uh, things are going into the platform. So especially the number of translation requests that are handled, the number of translation words, and the CPU cluster utilization. Uh, I, will use, I will use JMeter in order to create some load on the, on the platform. And we, in, in this, I already have a predefined script which has uh, an async translation flow defined which does one translation, it waits for the translation to finish, and it makes it retrieve the actual, uh, the actual translated content, content. I will start the script, and we see now that um, translation are, sta are already happening. Uh, we are going back into the Grafana UI. We see here that um, the number of translation requests increased. Actually, the first thing that we see is that the CPU cluster utilization increased from zero, actually one, two, two, uh, two, eleven, uh, ten, eleven, let's say. Uh, we see that also the number of translation requests stabilize around 120 translation requests per second. So I came back after five minutes in order to leave the number to actually stabilize. And we see here that the cluster utilization is around 10%, the number of requests are around 120 requests per second. We go back into the marathon and we scale the, the microservices to, to two instances. And uh, we see that it enters in deployment quite quickly. And in a few seconds, we will also see that the CPU um, uh, cluster utilization increases. Actually, uh, increased to, to approximately 10%. Uh, and gradually, we will see that also the numbers, the, the translation request, the translated, the, the translated word also uh, increase it. We will come back also in ca this case after three minutes to, so that uh, numbers are, are actually reaching a, a stable point. We will see that we increase from 120 to approximately 240 uh, per, per uh, uh, translation that are happening in a second. Um, and we will now go back into, into Marathon. And we will scale the microservices to 10 instances. We see that they will enter in the deployment state. Uh, so gradually, they will become healthy. So in, when they are becoming healthy, they are, they are actually uh, um, added to the, to the load balancer. So they, they actually start to receive some traffic. And uh, we will then go into, uh, into the Grafana and see that the cluster utilization starts to increase. Uh, that is tied to, to the number of, um, of instances that are, are brought up. We will come back also in this case after five minutes to leave the numbers to actually um, reach a, a stable point. And we see first. The, the cluster utilization, it's around 94%, 90, 94, 91%. Um, and we reach 1,000 translation requests per second with these 10 instances of, of this microservice. And it's quite uh, important to, to uh, notice also the number of uh, translated word increased. We will look now into perspective of what happened over the course of the last 30, 30 minutes. And now we see that, uh, so we started from zero, uh, not having any translation in the system. Then we, we reach 120 with one instance, 240 with two instances, and approximately 1,000 with 10 instances. We also translate from zero words per second to 30,000 words per second, then to 60,000 words per second, and then to 240 words per second. And we also saw that the cluster, um, CPU cluster utilization stabilized around um, 91%. If we go back into JMeter, we see that we have, we, we did during the course of 25 minutes, uh, more than 800,000 uh, translation requests with, with no, actually uh, with very few failures, one failure or something like that. So this, this was uh, actually uh, the demo that I, I wanted to show you. 
So now if you have uh, if you have any questions uh, please ask them. I will try to not move. So, sorry, as you were scaling it up, I noticed that um, you didn't have any labels or in marathons, so what are you using to do your load balancing? Um, okay, so we built um, a script that actually uh, a bridge between AJ Proxy and, and Marathon. So we are exposing our, uh, our let's say, our front end via, our endpoints are actually getting the request via the AJ Proxy layer. Uh, and practically when uh, it's a custom script, when we started two, three years ago, the Marathon LB and all the stuff that are not available were quite not available. So we had to do this part quite by hand. Uh, and it also contains a little bit of logic uh, and w in which we decide how to actually l route our request. But more or less, it's, it's not something really fancy. It enters into AJ proxy that decide where to send the request approximately. We have an algorithm that is not quite round robin, it's a custom implementation of round robin. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, on your future slide, uh, you showed that you also want to uh, bring HBase, etc., into Mesos world. How yes. do you plan to do that? Um, it's a really good question. <laughs> I actually, uh, wi while being these two days of the presentation, I actually tried to ask uh, many people how they are actually doing it. Um, I don't have actually an answer for that. Um, I see that the HDFS is already uh, in, into DCOS. I actually see that some people on, on GitHub, uh, they already did some, some implementation. And al also the guy from Portwax, I think, they, ha they, they told me that they have something to look into um, on, on, on how they are uh, porting uh, HBase into a, a Mesos cluster. So I don't have, I, I have a lot of tracks that I want to follow. I don't have, uh, unfortunately, a simple answer. Okay, any other questions? If not, you can find me around here. Um, and yeah, I also, if you want, I you can uh, send me messages on the Twitter part or you can contact me uh, in any way and I will try to, to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much.